Good evening, and thank you for inviting me to be here. It's a very exciting event, and I'm delighted to be part of it. Now, you might well wonder why someone who works on global intergovernmental organizations and someone who is now setting up a school of government, the Blavatnik School of Government in Oxford, is here speaking at the so Skoll Forum on social entrepreneurship. I did wonder that when um, Sally and Pamela and the organizers asked me to take part in this conversation. And I have to say, over the last two weeks, the conversations I had with people were not reassuring. I asked my government colleagues what they thought of social entrepreneurship. And some of them, I think one of them, one of the diplomats said, hmm, subsidized business with a social conscience. I'm not so sure about that. Of course, what, they, what lies underneath that um, view that social entrepreneurship is over there and government is over there is a recognition in most governments of the world that social entrepreneurs are bringing an energy, a client and community focus, innovation and information into areas which we used to think of as public policy and we now think of as social policy and social entrepreneurship. And that's a really important addition to the way in which communities can serve themselves and serve others. But, I sus but my conversations with people um, arriving to take part in the forum were equally disquieting. It seems to me that the admiration that government might not have for all of social entrepreneurship is shared by the admiration that social entrepreneurs do not have for government and for multilateral organizations. At first sight, I would confess, most governments are not agile, competitive, and entrepreneurial. In fact, there was a story that used to be told in Brazil about 20 years ago about a lion escaping from the zoo and running into the government buildings. And every day, the lion would eat a government official. Nobody noticed. <laughs> Nobody noticed until after 365 days, the lion made the terrible mistake of eating the tea lady. And then everybody noticed. Others would point to uh, America's arch diplomat, John Bolton's comment that if we removed the upper floors the entire upper half of the United Nations building. In fact, I think in that memorable diplomatic way of his, he suggested if we blew off the top half of the United Nations building, nobody would notice the result. I think for some of us who work with passion and enthusiasm on multilateral cooperation, the disquieting thing in that was a slight suspicion that sometimes it might be true. But I think what I, what I would like to talk about tonight is the way in which, in fact, if we peel back these hostilities from the two worlds, there is a whole lot that these two worlds can learn from each other. And I guess what I'd like to do is just to mention five ways in which multilateral cooperation, in which the international organizations which look so slow and tortuous to most social entrepreneurs are in fact learning quite a lot from social entrepreneurship and making that part of the way they operate. Just before I go there though, I do want to say um, a third conversation I had about the forum was somebody who saw what I was speaking on and came up to me and said in wonderment, you don't really believe in global governance, do you? As this was a sort of cult religion. And I said, well, what, what do you mean by that? That's what academics always say, by the way, when they're asked a, a tricky question. <laughs> but, but my answer to that is there, is there is no solution to some quite tricky, narrow problems without global cooperation. Global cooperation is not the solution to most problems. Most problems have local solutions. 
But there are some problems which are collective action problems. There are some problems which no individual community or government can solve without other governments acting with them, whether it's the financial crisis or the containment of an infectious disease. And it's for that that whether we like it or not, we have to look to global governance and global cooperation. The second point I'd like to make is that it's necessarily tortuous and slow. Hands up who took part in an election to elect a government in the last 10 years. Uh, so you're all active citizens. You see, you didn't go to all that effort of electing your government for your government to go off and tell international organizations to do whatever they like at any point in time. You elected your government to serve you. And if that government is going to serve you, it's going to not let international organizations do much unless they go through a long and tortuous process of deliberation, unless they protect your government's right to do as you would want your government to do. That's why international cooperation is difficult. It's a protection of actually something that you probably hold quite dear. So before we say, oh, well, it's all useless, we don't know who's in the cockpit and they're not acting quickly enough, we do have to recognize that trade-off. But nevertheless, it is tortuous and slow, but my point tonight is that a very large part of multilateral cooperation is changing very fast and not many people are noticing. About 80% of the budgets now being spent by the world's largest international organizations, about 80% is actually discretionary. It's special budgets aimed for specific purposes and governed by those countries who are putting up the money and putting up the money in proportion to the results that they can see. So what is it about this new multilateralism that I think reflects some lessons learned from social entrepreneurship? There's five things. And not all of these things are unproblematic. So let me give you the five things, and then just quickly, three of the problems that emerge from them that I think are the next set of challenges for, for you all as social entrepreneurs. So first, participation. We're seeing the old-fashioned, every government gets a seat around the table, crack open as these new initiatives are governed by boards which include civil society organizations, sufferers of diseases or people working on literacy, people from the communities that these initiatives serve. Think of Gavi, think of the Global Fund, think of the new vertical initiatives in global governance. Second, we're seeing a task focus a focus not on trying to resolve all systems, but solving one problem and focusing an initiative to solve that one problem. We're seeing a very demand-driven approach. As I said, contributions aimed just at that one effort in multilateral cooperation. We're seeing a new way of working with the users with a much greater user focus. So institutions working in country more directly with those who are actually delivering results in country. And finally, we're seeing a real shift to what I would call results-based legitimacy. Your legitimacy as an organization being measured against whether you are achieving the narrow goal that has been set for that activity. So these are five ways in which we're watching multilateral organizations create initiatives which are more agile, nimble, user-focused, which resemble a lot of the qualities that government officials secretly, without telling you all, were gazing at your social entrepreneurship activities wishing that they could do. But they're not without some problems, and I'd just like to mention three. When we talk about opening up participation, bringing civil society organizations in, bringing in the social entrepreneurs, bringing in affected community groups, bringing them to the table of governance. Let's not forget that they very quickly become stakeholders in the status quo. In other words, the radical entrepreneur or civil society representative very quickly becomes the most ardent defender of the organization and the board on which they now have a seat. So beware, you might soon wish you had lions in your organization <laughs> rather than the new sets of vested interests. The second concerns the task focus. And this, I think, is an issue 
for the scaling up discussion of the next three days. The vertical initiatives in, in global governance, the ones that say we are going to focus all our efforts on combating HIV AIDS, for example, or in delivering treatment for HIV AIDS to communities, do pose a question of who is accountable for those decisions, given that they always imply a trade-off. In any country of the world, including the wealthiest, health budgets involve trade-offs. Do you spend your money on maternal mortality? Do you spend it on ARVs? When you have a government making that decision, there is a very rudimentary and crude accountability where communities can elect or throw out their governments through elections. If it's the international community or external actors bringing those priorities in, then who is accountable? Is it just the fact that one campaign hires the best public relations firm in the world that leads that to be the legitimate priority for a community in Zambia? Or do we want to rethink that and think about the social part of social entrepreneurship and ask who is socially accountable for the priorities that we might be inadvertently setting inside communities? That's an issue for the new multilateral initiatives. I think it's an issue for scaled up social entrepreneurship. And finally, the paying for what you get model. The idea, the great part of this is demand driven. Stop forcing on people what you think you can deliver best and start asking what they really want and delivering it. That's been at the heart of social entrepreneurship, the idea that the market gives you a great indication of what people want, so work with it to deliver social services and other things. But the problem is that once you scale that up, what you're not paying for are some things that are nevertheless very important, which we tend to like to call public goods. So, for example, what you're not paying for is the aggregate knowledge and information that you might want to have in a public sector organization to hold the private sector to account. We've seen several examples of this. The financial sector, the nuclear industry, the food industry. Industries where there is a lot of knowledge and research in the industry, but there is a public interest in being able constantly to check that that information is correct, to triangulate it against public knowledge. That's just one of the many public goods that we fund through governments, that we fund through multilateral organizations, but that as social entrepreneurship scales up, you might want to consider in your own sector as to how it is that you will ensure that those public goods are actually being delivered. So in sum, I guess, my message would be that as you scale up, you will need to collaborate, as Jeff Skoll said in his opening remarks. You'll need to collaborate more and more with governments, with international organizations, not all of whom have had the lion treatment, so some of them will look heavily populated and bureaucratic. But I guess my message is that there are at least these five ways I've spoken to you this evening about five ways in which those organizations are transforming, and that opens up new ways for you to work with them, and it also shows you the way that your work can affect them. Finally, of course, it shows you some of the challenges that you might find in your own organizations as you scale up. But with that, I'd like to stop and leave it to you to solve these problems over the next few days. Thank you very much.